Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. All right, everybody, welcome to Revolution. Uh, glad you're here. Uh, wherever you're listening, glad you're listening, as always. Um, so this is a talk I've been kind of teasing for a while. Um, uh, felt like September would be the right time to talk about my depression and mental health. Um, there's a lot of stigma around mental health issues and mental illness. And I believe as being a haphazardly human pastor, I, it is my job to try to take some of that stigma away. I've always kind of wanted to push the boundaries with things. And uh, Pete says I have a self-destructive drive in me, um, but I've used it in proper ways, like standing up for my LGBTQ brothers and sisters years ago, and maybe talking about my mental health a little sooner than people would be comfortable with. Um, so how to get this thing started? I've been dealing with mental health issues most of my life, um, probably since probably even before my parents' scandal happened in the 80s, the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker scandal. Um, but after that, it really hit, and I dealt with it in high school, and, and dealing with depression and anger and confusion of uh, what happened to everything I knew and how that all fell apart. Um, spending years visiting my father in prison, um, just not knowing exactly what life was like, going from one extreme to another. Um, I've had some people tell me I suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, I guess that can happen when every comedian and news person and preacher and everything else is making fun of your parents and using them as examples. Um, now, I don't tell you any of this for you to feel sorry for me. I tell this story so you can understand me and maybe... Um, I can help touch a familiar place in your heart where maybe you've been ostracized through maybe church or your family or just suffer from depression. Uh, just suffer from it. Um, three years, it's been extreme. Um, for the past three years, it was really extreme for me. Um, I, I, I uh, went to outpatient programs uh, or in, inpatient, outpatient kind of thing. And um, I did DBT, which is dialectic behavioral therapy. Um, and had psychoanalysts and psychiatrists for years, you know, since I was in New York. Um, I think that all really, really started for me when my first marriage fell apart and my mom died all within about the same week. And so I started dealing with that and uh, learning that I have ways of avoiding the pain. You know, after my first divorce and my mother died, I met a lovely woman, jumped in a relationship with her for three years didn't deal with my problems, then broke up, and then fell apart, more so than I should have over that relationship. And um, what I've learned is, is you can't push mental illness. You can't take depression. You can't take that uh, grief and just push it away because it always finds a way to come out. And it is just sitting there waiting to come out. Um, you have to go through it. Um, and this past year, I've gone through it. Last year, this month, my wife and I separated. And I had a mental, mental breakdown. It was September last year. It was all of a sudden, one of the people I depended on the most was gone. Just not there anymore. Um, 
and it probably had to do a lot with my mental health as part of the end of the relationship. You know, we were very different people, probably should have never gotten married, and my mental health um, highlighted our problems and our issues. Um, I lost all hope. Um, I don't know how much of it I can talk about here because I still feel like it's fresh. You know, it's like I feel like I'm talking to you about something that I've gone through and a, 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 a tragedy that I've survived and a wound and I'm sitting up here in bandages going like, oh no, I'm fine. And you're like slowly watching blood come through some of the bandages going like, what? <laughs> Should you be at a doctor's office? Um, kind of how it feels. Um, I felt that God had, was gone. I felt like I was a failure as a human being. Um, I had constant panic attacks and the feeling that I had let people down in my life, that I had failed. Um, it's honestly strange what a year can do. But before we get into what a year can do, I shared last week on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, it was National um, Suicide Awareness Day. And so I'm going to read that to you. I wrote, a year ago, I tried to take my own life. I'm not proud of this and still feel some shame. I only share this to give hope to the suffering. It will get better. Life is not easy, but my experience has shown me it's worth living and being true to oneself. So when the separation happened, I moved into a friend of mine's house, and um, they were amazing. They had like six kids and them, and they gave me one of their rooms, and I mean, it was all I had. Everything was gone. The home that me and my wife had bought together, I wasn't able to see my kids as much because I didn't have a crib for many, and you know, and it was tough with all of the kids that were at the house. So I got to see Milo, I think, once a week, and yeah, it was it, it was a tough time, and not having the support of the one you depended on most was tough. But I can't blame her because she was also going through a separation, you know. So it's not like why weren't you there? It's like no, you were dealing with the complexities of what it is to go through a separation, and she had to deal with it and cope with it on her own, in her own way. Um, but when I was living at the house, probably the first week, I decided that I was done living. And I felt like I was a failure, uh, but that my mental health had, had stifled all my creativity um, my self-esteem was done. I had no more self-esteem left. Because um, it wasn't just listening to the voices and the critics on the outside, but listening to the own negative voices in my own head that said, you're crap. You're not worthy of love. You know, you're a misfit. You don't belong. You know, you don't deserve to be who you are. You're a fake. You're not a good pastor. You don't need to be doing this. So I took a pill, I took a bottle of pills, of sleeping pills. Um, fortunately, those sleeping pills, I woke up, not knowing I woke up, and called someone I had been in a men's counseling group with, who happened to be a doctor, and said, I just took a bottle full of pills. I don't remember this. Okay, this is this is this shows you our instinct to live. And he said, Is there anybody in the house? And I said, Yes. And Scott was in the house and I walked downstairs and I said, Scott, talk to the doctor, and the doctor was like, Jay's overdosed. 
call an ambulance. And I remember, the one thing I kind of remember is saying, Scott, can you just drive me? I don't want to go in an ambulance. And Scott was like, no. <laughs> We're calling an ambulance. Then that's the last thing I remember until I woke up in the hospital, ended up spending three or four days in um, a mental health facility, which some would call the mental ward, um, which was awful. It was... Uh, it's kind of like going to prison. You know, they strip search you and then they put you in a jumpsuit and go to your medications and talk to you and it feels like you're never going to get out of there. Um, I was broken. One of my pastor friends, Tony Jones, came to see me on a regular basis. It was just a few days, but he wanted to know why. You know, because Tony had seen me at the top of my game. He'd seen me speak to 5,000 people. You know, he'd seen me do, you know, we, I was a part of the emergent church, and he was a part of the emergent church, and when we were all peaking and doing these huge things, he saw me doing all these things, and we crossed paths and spoke at all these events together, and now he's just seen me broken and done. And I said, I just can't live up to the expectations anymore. I can't be what others want me to be. You know? And that's why. I said, I just can't do it anymore. Um, I'm filtering myself a little bit for the time being. Um, through that, they asked me to go to ACT, which is electric shock therapy. Um, that seems to be a way to help with suicidal thoughts. Um, we just did a Meet the Congregation with Brian Yarborough, a friend of mine, who found out I was going through this, and he said he lives in Houston, and he goes, I'm on a plane right now, and I'm going to drive you to ECT every day. And I don't know if you know what ECT does to you, but you lose your short-term memory. So I couldn't remember if I ate, you know, you couldn't drive, couldn't see my kids, you know, I was confused. I had given all my medication to Heather, who I was living with, uh, Scott and Heather, Heather, Scott's wife. Um, and then I was like, where's my medication? I don't know what I did with my medication. You know, I mean, it was just constantly like I didn't know where I was, what was going on in my life. I was just completely lost, you know. And it was hard because I didn't have a huge support group around me. I had a few friends and... I don't think anybody knew what was going on, and the one person I wanted to be there, I had told, I don't want to be with you anymore. And so that was the fact. And having a broken heart, going through a mental breakdown, um, is a horror that I don't wish on anyone. Um, I have no Bible verses to give you a cure. You know, I, I, I rely on the Bible and love the Bible and preach the Bible, but I, I, don't have a, I don't have a secret verse for you to tell you what to do in a time like this. Um, I can tell you as a f what you could do as a friend. Read Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Never give up, never lose faith, always be hopeful, endure through every circumstance, and listen. I was surprised. I went back one time and looked at all the text messages that I sent to a couple of my close friends. And I mean, it was just babbling and, and insanity. And I was surprised that some of them stood by me and stuck with me and listened to it. Because I had some people who said, Jay, you just need to move on. Get over it. Get over your wife. Get over this, maybe close the church, go get a job, and just move on. It's funny, I was talking to Pete Rollins last night, and Pete says, you know, had you had listened to some of those people, you'd be stocking a shelf right now. 
but it was people like Pete Rollins who said, nope, we're going to get through this. There's something on the other side of this. And that was hope. Now, if you're familiar with Pete Rollins' work, his work is not the most hopeful work in the world. He is a philosopher and uh, practices radical theology and philosophy. And, but part of that is embracing pain. Embracing that life is painful, embracing that we have hard times, embracing that life is suffering. You know, and that's something we don't always hear about, is embracing the suffering of life. Even though if we look, really look deep at like people like the Apostle Paul, even Jesus, and, and different folks, these folks were suffering all the time. But it's just so cute for us. Like, oh, he was in prison for a while, and then the gates opened, and then he walked out. You know what I mean? It's like... Oh, he had the scars on his body for what he said. And like, probably when he was getting, Paul was getting those scars on his body, probably wasn't a really uplifting time. Probably when he was first going to the church of Galatia, and he was, I think, was it Galatians church he was the first went to, where he was all nasty and they took him in anyway? What, or was that Corinthians? I can't remember. Anyway, but it, there's a lot of suffering in the Bible. Um, even James talks about it, you know, be grateful when you suffer because you suffer with Christ, you know, and you can, you know, it'll great, create greater expectations on your, your faith. Now, I used to be like, oh, that's kind of bullshit. And, um, <laughs> you know, especially this time, because I was like, eh, this is real suffering, guys. Um, but something, uh, this is probably going to be a two-parter, just so you know. Um, I had my kids this week, so this one will be a little bit less organized. My next one will be like, "Ain't me, brothers and sisters," and you guys will be shouting and hollering because um, I'll have a little more time to prepare. Be prepared by Wednesday rather than Saturday night. Um, it's so strange, though. If you look at my notes, usually they look like this because I'm dyslexic. So I just take a, like a few notes, and then I just preach off the stuff that I have, and just riff off of it. This is my notes for today, just written out. Um, not something that's normal for me to do. And so all of a sudden I became a Presbyterian pastor. Um, but it was a few people who stood, well, stood with me along the way, all playing different parts. Some knew what to say at the right time, and some knew what to not to say the wrong, <laughs> say the wrong thing at the right time. Um, but it is amazing what a little support will do for someone when they're suffering and going through mental health struggles. You know, there was a time before service every Sunday, probably six or seven months ago, I would bawl every morning before service. I mean, just fall apart. And uh, I didn't know what was going on. I'd call Pete, and it would be like 6 a.m., 5 a.m. where he was. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't want to do this. i got to preach today. What am I going to do? One of the only times I've ever showed up to a service here and said, I've got nothing for you today. And so we just sat and talked. That's the church to me. That's this church. Um, I don't think the church is a safe place, but I think it's often a time where we can be bear our scars and our burdens to one another. I mean, I remember times where I would just show up and me and Caleb would just look at each other and start crying because Caleb could, knew the pain I was going through. You know? And there's something that's said to be said about empathy. You know? Um, it's one of the strongest forces in this world. Uh, there was this quote that said, empathy is more radical than the middle finger. You know? 
And it's and in a way, it's true. When you learn to empathize with others, that's why I've talked about empathizing with those that we don't agree with and not scapegoating each other. I feel like I had a lot of people kind of reflect their own failures on me, those who told me to give up because some of them had given up and just, yeah, you just need to give up and move on and just get a job and cook dinner for your kids and just be a dad and, and not live your best, you know, not live your life in this. Only thing I've ever known since I was 18 is being a pastor. I love being a speaker or a pastor. I love it. it. It's a passion. Why do I show up when there's only 10 people in a room? Because that's, I have a passion for it. I believe in it. I can show up where there's 50 people in the room. I can show up when there's one person in the room. There's been times where I've shown up and it was me and Kurt. And I was really grateful that Kurt wasn't speaking that day because it would have just been Kurt then. <laughs> um, but it is amazing what a little support will do but it's equally a little amazing or a little a little criticism goes a long way as well during this time I had people tell me that they felt that I was spineless that I was being pathetic. Um, and that was tough to hear. But for the past few years of my life, I'd just slowly been losing my self-confidence. I'd slowly stopped believing in myself and believing in this ministry, in this church. And I just... And I already had those voices in my head, so it was just other people reaffirming those negative thoughts in my head. You know, I tried to kill myself. Were there other times where I thought about doing it again? Yeah. I thought, oh, I've got better ways to do it this time. The next time it won't be pills. The next time it'll be something that will do it. But I had friends who talked me down and got me where I needed to go. I also had therapy. I also had medication. I had many different types of therapy. The ECT uh, helped a lot. I stopped having panic attacks and started crying all the time. <laughs> I don't know which one is better, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, crying can be uh, exhausting, but I guess the crying was better. And I was just been a completely broken person up until about probably three or four months ago. Um, You know, I'm not sure how to be, to be like, honest of how to be so open at this point, but I'm doing my best to try to make sense of this for you. Maybe if I share with you some of the folks who were there and kind of give you just a little bit of rundown on that, and I kind of have. But people like Scott and Heather, they opened their home to me, made meals for me, drove me to go eat. It wasn't easy having me there. They had one bathroom, six kids, the two of them, you know, and just some like crazy depressed guy sitting up in the room, you know. Um, and then bringing my own kids over there. So then we had 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 people in this tiny house. But we made it work. We just, it was community. Did we argue? Yeah. Did we have to go through things and deal with tough things? Yes. Was there tough love involved sometimes? Hell yeah. Was there compassion involved? Most of the time. I survived. When I had to leave my home and move out of my house and finally found an apartment, this congregation went to my old house and packed all my stuff up and moved me to my new apartment. And I was so grateful for that because I just felt lost and alone and I didn't know what to do. I was scared. I think I cried the first night I had the apartment. You know, leaving the home that I bought with my wife that I thought that we would live in forever or for a long time at least and raise our children um, all of a sudden came to an end. Going through mediation, 
when you're going through mental health issues, is tough. You know, separating all your, all your property, everything, just arguing over mundane shit. It was torture. You know? And I was, I'm not going to lie, I was still in love. Um, but Scott and Heather were great. Two years ago, a crazy guy showed up named Caleb, shows up to service, walks up to me, and he's like, hey, man, I'm here at Revolution. Good to see you. I'm like, yeah, why are you here? What are you doing here? He's like, I came here to be a part of this church. And I was like, uh-oh. Here's somebody I'm going to let down really quick. Because this is, I've been doing this for over 20 years, so I've had people who've been like, God sent me to you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, was I pleasantly surprised. Um, Caleb has got us on every website where you can listen to down, listen to the services as possible. He's helped me get organized. We have a new podcast that we do where we introduce the congregation to people. Um, he's spoken for me countless times. He's not a preacher, but he's becoming one and or a speaker. I don't even know what we call ourselves anymore because um, we've been doing a lot of deconstruction. But it, you know, Hillary Clinton, didn't she say it takes a village? Is that her book? <laughs> it does take a village. The church is people. You know, this is not the Jay Baker show. And it couldn't have been this past year. You know, my buddy Kurt here spent time with just going out with me to bars. Really crappy bars. <laughs> Ones that didn't have girls in them. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, at least I could look at girls. Nope, we're going to go to this one. <laughs> you can see a lot of other unhappy people sitting at a bar. Radical therapy, Kurt, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, but he also got me going back to punk shows. And I'll say, you know what? Punk rock and skateboarding saved my life too. There's a community in the punk rock world that there's nothing like it. There's this DIY, do-it-yourself spirit that just kind of says, F you, I'm doing it anyway. Oh, and this, that show's only going to have five people. I don't care. I'm doing a show. We went to a house show the other night. and I mean, there was probably 40 people there. You know, it was pretty good. But it was the tiniest little place I'd ever been in. And I happened to be the oldest man in the room, um, which was nice. Um, but the fact was, it was just seeing that spirit was still alive. You know, these kids putting together a house show to do this little punk rock show. And I was like, man, this is what revolution was all about. You know, just doing it. And uh, so it's like Caleb and, and, and folks like Kurt did that. Now, another person, another friend of mine, Tony Jones, who's some people don't, some people have issues with Tony Jones. And, and, and you know what? I, Take your issues, man. You know, he got internet shamed and uh, went through a lot of hell on the internet. Um, but I know him and I know his life and I, I know him personally. Type A personality, completely different than me. I'm like an introvert, passive introvert, you know. And he just said, I refuse to let you die. You know, I'll put you back into the mental hospital before I let you die. Um, he said, you're going to make it through this mediation. I'm going to sit down with you, and I'm going to show you how to communicate with the mediators, because I've been there. And he shared his experience and strength and hope with me and gave me the possibility to do that. You know, I, I know this might be boring and not as exciting as what you thought it would be, like, oh, he's going to talk about depression and mental health and all this stuff. But what I'm trying to show you is these little things. Now, I have some questions that I asked people if they had any questions online, and I'm going to read those to you and try to answer a couple of those here in a second. Um, I mentioned Brian Yarborough, my buddy Brian. I mean, I've always said that Brian used to be a pastor, 
and then he quit being a pastor. And um, he's still more of a pastor than anybody I know. I always said my hope is, is if, you know, I get to heaven one day and there is a heaven uh, and I meet Jesus, he's like Brian. Brian's just one of those really, really good people. That uh, So if you haven't listened to the Brian Yarborough interview yet for Meet Your Congregation, do that after this. Make time to do it. Um, there's been some other people who I'll mention probably in part two. Um, Lawrence, my friend Lawrence, Pastor Lawrence, came and saw me in the mental hospital. Yeah, it's just neat to see the people who show up. Because it's funny, as a kid, I remember the people who would come see my dad in prison and the people who wouldn't, you know. And for as much as we might not, you know, agree with people like Billy Graham and Franklin Graham, Billy Graham showed up and visited my dad in prison. And Franklin Graham did too. You know, and I don't really mean Franklin Graham do not get along. I could not call Franklin Graham right now and get my call to go through. Let's just put it that way. But he showed up in prison. And one of the things I've reading, been reading this book, Emancipation After Hegel, and it talks about life is full of contradictions. And even when you realize it's full of contradictions, you don't get away from those contradictions. Those contradictions are still there. You just move forward towards them. You just know now that there's contradictions. So sometimes there's even contradictions that our enemies have, but they also go, oh, wait a second. They probably didn't start out going like, I'm going to tell people that God wants us all to have guns and gays should not be good. They probably started out saying, I want people to know that they're loved. And sometimes that little bit of love is still there. Do you guys remember the end of Return of the Jedi where Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, father and son, are fighting to the death. And he's saying either join the dark side or I'm going to kill you. And Luke Skywalker at one point puts his lightsaber down and goes, there's still good in you. I can feel it. And there becomes this moment where the emperor, who's putting everything together, who, who's Darth Vader's boss, starts shooting him with this force lightning and killing him. And that moment and that glimpse of goodness that the son felt comes alive in the father. And the father says, I can't allow this to happen. And he picks up the emperor and throws the emperor down a chute, some sort of giant space chute. Um, <laughs> you know, they always have big, big places that are, you know, really probably wouldn't pass inspection in the, uh, <laughs> they needed better inspectors. But throws him down the chute, and uh, that's the redemptive story of Darth Vader. And he takes off his dad's mask and realizes he's just a man. He's not as evil as he thought he was. And he goes, I want to save you, Father. Don't take your mask off. You know, you'll die. I want to save you. And he goes, you already have. That's a life full of contradictions. Sometimes all it takes is a seeing the good in someone. And, you know... There's a David Bazan song that says, save your applause till the end of the show. You know, you don't know what's going to happen till the end of the show. Our heroes become enemies, our enemies become heroes. I was looking at an uh, Instagram post. And there was a guy who had a giant SS tattooed on his side. Now, you know the SS, right? Nazis. And then the next picture was covered up with, these, with a dragon and a burr or something fighting. But underneath, the tattoo artist had wrote, redemption, a second chance, moving on. And I go, this tattoo artist has more compassion and more grace 
than most of my progressive friends would online. And now, of course, he didn't show the person's face because he knew that we don't always have the capability of letting people's pasts go and forgiving them. How did this sermon on depression become one about loving your enemies and changing them? It is the contradictions that we have to see, and it's the contradictions that going to the edge of death has allowed me to see and embrace. And I'm still choosing love and grace despite all this. There is one person I'm having a hard time forgiving, and that's a person who's the closest to me. I'm struggling with that, but I see good. And then there's good old Pete Rollins, philosopher, Irishman. Irish people are tough as nails, man. You, you talk about being around somebody when you're going through a hell. Uh, Pete and me have been through hell a few times. And they're not the most gentle people in the world. <laughs> you know, the way they show you they love you is by taking the piss out of you, as they say in Ireland, by giving you a hard time, you know, and um, making light of a really tough situation and making a joke about it. And you go, oh, you know, <laughs> but then you realize they really love you. And the one thing that Pete kept doing is saying, don't give up. I've never wanted to die so badly in my life. I've never lost so much hope in my own life and that of others and that in God ever. It was all gone. I wanted to die. I did not want to live. You know, and it's so funny that some people thought like, hey, you know, go get a job at Walmart and you'll be happier, you know. And Pete said, no. I'm like, Pete, I don't know if I believe in God. And he goes, keep going. There's something there. There's theology there. There's still room in the church for that. He's like, the only difference between you and some other people is, is that you'll be honest saying, I don't know if I believe in God. A lot of preachers get up there and are struggling with it but are afraid to say it. Keep going forward. With, a, with that and with Caleb, I made the decision a few months ago to jump feet first back into the ministry, back into my work. That's the better term, my work. I want to write a book on punk rock theology. Um, I'd like to eventually write a book about mental health. Um, you know... And it's because someone believed in me and cared enough for me and stuck with me through all the hell, through all the hard times, listened to my obsessive talk about going, oh, I want this person back, and them going, no, let me remind you how bad it was. And them going, and then me going, well, they did this, 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 and this, and them going, well, Jay, you did this, you did this, and you did this. You're not the, also the innocent party. Someone who was willing to speak truth to me as well. Not telling me to move on, just telling me to be responsible, embrace life's contradictions. You can love and hate people at the same time. And that might be the beauty of contradictions being in life. You know, that might be the reason why Jesus told us to love our enemies is because we kind of lose ourselves a little bit when we love our enemies. And there can be a contradiction in there in loving someone who's trying to destroy you. There is a contradiction there. Grace is a contradiction. Grace is for those people you don't want to have it. It's like free speech. That's what grace is. Love your enemies. Be kind to them. Do good to them. That is a contradiction. Atheists, new, the new atheists, when they point that out and say that's just, or when people, I preach about it, or when I tweet about it, and people point it out and go, like, that's just wishy-washy, that's just rainbow dreams and kittens and, and unicorns. They're right. Yeah, it's a contradiction. But guess what? Life is contradiction. Life is full of contradictions. How do we take these contradictions, how do we take these destructive drives and mold them into something that changes the world? Martin Luther King Jr. knew he was going to die. 
eventually, probably by someone's bullet. But he did it anyway. So I, I'm grateful for people like Peter Rollins um, in my life. Grateful for all of the folks I've mentioned here. Um, I couldn't have done it without you. I also couldn't have done it without the online community. I was so shocked that people stuck by. We interviewed someone for the, uh, the podcast uh, for the Meet Your Congregation, and they said... Um, They said, oh, I've only been following you for seven months. And I got a lot out of it. And I'm going like, wow, the worst possible time in my life where I felt like I had nothing to give, someone said you had something to give. I mean, it, I mean, it touched my heart. Um, Let's see if I can pull up some of these questions. Someone asked, I'd love to hear the stress of being the child of a minister that contributes to anxiety, if applicable for you. Well, pretty applicable, <laughs> um, especially since my dad is a huge Trump supporter and going through all this. And to be honest with you, we weren't very close through all this, probably when I could have used my dad the most. But unfortunately, in this world, politics are so bring so much division to all of us. That's why I also talk about this. Is like, can we still sit down and argue well? Why do we have to go straight to war? Why do we have to scapegoat one another? Uh, there's a term I've been hearing lately, like cancel. You've been canceled on, on Twitter. Like, you know, someone who's like, no longer worthy of being, you know, they did two bad things and they're no longer worthy of redemption. Like the guy with the SS tattoo. You know what I mean? Like, he wouldn't be worthy of redemption. But a tattoo artist said, yeah, you've grown. Your life has changed. You've become a different person. You're worthy of redemption. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of anxiety towards that. I mean, you know, I had people te texting me during this time telling me, why don't you get your father's life together? Why don't you confront your father? Why don't you do this? And you know, I'm trying to be like, I'm falling apart right now. Um, Josh, who was just here and spoke for us last week, I was supposed to do his wedding. And I'm like, man, my life is falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. I honestly don't think I can do in good conscience I can do your wedding. I don't think I could do a wedding today. Um, I would love to hear how you think we can support each other in a positive ways and encourage each other to ask for help. Um, One thing I did learn in, in an outpatient therapy or inpatient outpatient therapy, basically we do the hospital for a few hours a day, is how to ask for help. How to be transparent about how you're feeling, you know, and they said, you need more help. Well, I want to die. I want to kill myself. Okay, I can, I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to stay on the phone with you. Or I'm going to take you and get you. Because I'd actually went to the mental hospital twice. The first time I was still married, and I was feeling suicidal, and I was going through this thing. And they taught me to go up and say, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm feeling, and being transparent. It was scary, because it's a scary place to be. Um, there was a pastor just a few days ago who killed himself. Who, talked, who had a ministry for people suffering from mental health issues. And he didn't make it. And I thought, man, I'm not crazy. That I'm talking about surviving a suicide attempt, probably the best thing I ever failed at. And this guy succeeded. And he had two kids, just like me, and a wife. And he's gone. And he'll never get the opportunity to realize what life is worth living. How do you cope with the voices in your head that won't stop and you feel like it's always going to be like this? Um, one of the things I learned in DBT was learning to see those voices as clouds or like a leaf on a river and just seeing them as thoughts. 
and allowing those thoughts to pass by. Sometimes you kind of have to push them. Now this takes time. Now that's the thing is this takes time to do. It takes a year to do. It takes a lot of work and a lot of practice and a lot of like, I mean, three different types of therapy plus a psycho psychiatrist. Now to be honest with you, I'm on, I'm on one medication now and I was probably on like five medications before this. So luckily I got a good psychiatrist who was like, you don't need to be on all this crap. We're going to help get things straightened out for you. But learning to say no to those voices in your head takes time. But I would do stuff like stand in front of a mirror and I'd hear those things and I would just say no. I started calling the voices Jerry. <laughs> and I'd say, no, Jerry. Uh, and if you're guessing that it was named after Jerry Falwell, you're correct. Um, But it took time going through therapy, crying, feeling, losing, you know, sometimes not getting it. And, you know, now my therapist is like, you've done so much hard work to get where you're at. And I'm like, yeah, I feel, you know, I've tried. And she's like, no, you haven't tried. You've done. You've done the work. And it takes work. And unfortunately, we live in a country where freaking health care is so hard to come by. And to be honest with you, my insurance stinks. I'm paying a ton of money. I live in a crappy apartment in Uptown, you know. And barely making it, but I'm grateful that I do have something like that that has allowed me to get the medical attention that I need and to be able to work through these demons. I am still kind of shocked when I get a bill because I still have co-pays and things like that, and it's, it's a mess. Um, I don't usually talk a lot about my left politics, but some things I like about this guy, um, we'll just call him BS. I like some of BS's ideas on on healthcare. <laughs> That's you know who could that be? Um, and some people think he is full of BS. So there you go. <laughs> Take it how you will. How do you feel about diagnoses? In what ways did it get diagnosed? Help you hinder or growth or recover? Did you ever receive a diagnosis that you wish you didn't? No, I got a lot of different diagnoses. I actually one time had a therapist say I had double depression. Um, not a lot of people heard that. You can Google it. It's actually a diagnosis. It's one they didn't, haven't given for a long time. But it just means that you suffer from depression, but you also have a secondary thing where you're just a person that is constantly depressed. So in some ways, it felt like a prison sentence of like, I'll never be free from being depressed. Now, do I still get depressed? Yes. Do I still have times where I have shed a few tears in awkward moments? Yes. Um, did I probably have double depression at the time, given my life experiences and everything that was going on? Yes. Do I have it now? Probably not. There's a couple more people asked questions, and I have to look at this other thing on my Phone. Sorry, everybody. This is that's me trying to be interactive. Do, 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 do. You know what's nice is I'm getting stuff like, I appreciate how you overcame the stigma and talk about mental illness. It's important. I can't wait. I'm, I'm in the throes of an anxiety attack right now myself. You got this. EMDR especially if you've had any weird feels about it at first. It gave me a church vibe, but then it was awesome. EMDR is really weird because you follow this little line and you go into the probably the, you know, back and forth and they have these pads that vibrate back and forth. And I refused to do it for a year because I was like, you know, that kind of sounds like magic. That sounds like leeches. I'm going to pass on that one. <clears throat> and then finally they pushed me to it and it's been a miracle. I've worked through some issues with my dad and I'm now moved on to another issue that I'm dealing with, and it's pretty amazing. If it's relevant, perhaps you can touch on losing faith in the time of struggle. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I lost my faith. I felt like God was dead. My mom was dead. First wife didn't work out. Second marriage, I had two beautiful kids and ended up having a... Uh, my partner ended up 
having a lot of resentment towards me. And I can understand why, because there was a lot of things I was incapable of doing. And the things I wanted to do and the things she wanted to do were completely different. We were just completely different people. You know, and, and, and that's okay. Sometimes that happens, you know. Um, but yeah, I lost my faith. I felt like God wasn't there. Now I feel like I don't know what God is. I don't know if I believe in an intervening God anymore, in an interventionist God, because I feel like God sure is picky about what God intervenes. Because <laughs> I was crying out in my shower, Jesus, where are you? I was told you would be here. And it reminded me of a moment when my mom was dying of cancer and she was very frail. And she wanted to take a communion in front of this picture of Jesus. And, um, and she started crying. And she goes, why isn't God showing up? Why isn't Jesus here? As we're taking communion, where is God? And I said, I don't know. And my sister said, Mom, you stopped going to chemo. And it became that an argument happened. You know, I was like, and I was like, she's got a point. You know, Mom, you, had, you could have kept going to chemo and kept doing some of the things that you needed to do, but you decided you didn't want to fight anymore. Um, because I believe we have to do the practical things too. I mean, I went to all these therapies and still going to these therapies. Great is my one therapist has only seen me twice a week. And now she wants every two weeks and wants to see me now once a month and feels like I'm doing good, I'm doing better. But no, losing God was one of the toughest things for me to do. So it's hard to, to grieve your marriage, to grieve your God, and then show up on Sunday to preach a sermon. Bit of a conundrum. But I think Jesus experienced that too. Jesus sitting in the garden, let this pass from me. Jesus on the cross, Father, why have you forsaken me? What do you do when you don't fit anywhere in your own world and you've lost all your hope? For me, it's become creating a new world that I do fit in. For me, it's realizing who I am and embracing that and saying, you know what, there's a structure that I don't fit in and I'm going to move outside of that structure and live in the structure of my best life. I'm going to go to my punk rock shows. I'm going to do my church. I'm going to go on feet first. And I'm not going to allow the expectations of the others to drive me anymore. I just can't do that. I'm not going to go around taking polls anymore. What should I do with my life? What should I do with this? You know, how should I make a living? What, should I, what shoes should I wear? You know, what's this? You know, I'm not going to take polls anymore. Who should I date? Who shouldn't I date? No, no, no. no. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to follow my instincts now. Because part of my depression and my mental health was, was, was compromising who I was because I thought it was the right thing to do. And all it did was compound the mental illness and the destruction and the despair and going, I can't be that. And all of a sudden it was, I'm not supposed to be that. That's not who I am. I've got to find out who I am. My mom wrote a book years and years ago called I Gotta Be Me. And I remember some people pushed back. They're like, no, that's not a very Christian thing to say. You know what? It is. You've got to be you. You've got to be who you were created to be. You've got to follow your passions and your purposes, especially if you deal with mental health. You can't let other people dictate who you're supposed to be. And you have to start to not give a damn. That doesn't mean you don't love people. It just means you go, that's their opinion. And I'm going to let that one go. That's not for me. In AA, we have this thing where it says, take what you want and leave the rest. And so I've had to learn to really live that in my life as a human being, as saying, I'm going to live my life and take what I want and leave the rest. 
I'm never going to be a nine to five guy. I'm never going to be rich. You know, I don't know if I'll ever own a home again. And that's okay. I don't like mowing the lawn. I don't like shoveling snow. I don't like making dinner. I mean, I make dinner for my kids that they don't eat. Um, <laughs> nothing like throwing away vegetables. Um, good news is they're getting vegetables. Bad news is they're all in the garbage can. Now I'm having to like, <laughs> be like, if you eat five bites of that, you can have a little bit of chocolate after dinner. Um, that's my new parenting skill. <clears throat> the, next, the next one was, just be the same awesome one who you are and you've always been. That's nice. The next one was, just thank you for being real and helping many. Then the next one was, not sure what to ask. I'm just glad you're here saying these words. Those are nice to hear. That's, that was the online folks hitting back. But I'm glad to say I'm not the man I used to be. You know, I'm living life on life's terms, but I'm living life on my own life's terms. And uh, I've had to shut out the other voices. And I think that's part of living with mental illness and mental health is you just want to be a people pleaser. You want people to be happy with you. Um, but it's so destructive when you can't that you, you, you go into this, this, this just hole of I'm not good enough. Why can't I live up to this? Why can't I do this? And what I want to say to you folks out there who are dealing with that and going through this hell is run. Be who you are. Don't let the bastards get you down. You know, everybody has an opinion. Even with my type A friends, I've sat down with them and said, oh, this doesn't really help. I appreciate what you're saying, but it doesn't really help. And what I've realized is the great thing about a lot of type A people is they go, oh, okay. You know, because they're used to confrontation and dealing with it. You know, they're not, no, you need to do what I'm saying. You know. Um, I've had some of Job's friends give up God, stop ministry, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. You know, God's not going to show up, so why do you, you know, and you don't, you don't even believe in interventionist God anymore, so why don't you just move on and and live life, and no. I'm going to do the best I can with my church, and I'm going to jump feet first into the ministry that I've been called to and try to figure out what it's all about. And if people want to come along for the ride, great. If they don't, that's okay, too. I'm going to keep loving my enemies and, and preaching grace and, and talking about scapegoating and ruffle feathers and piss off the right and piss off the left and you know, just be who I am and continue this journey um, that I'm grateful now to have. I'm grateful for the place that I'm in. Do those old roles slip back in? Those old habits slip back in? Yes. But you know what I've learned to do through DBT is opposite action. You know, oh, I'm going to want to sleep all day. I feel horrible. I don't want to do anything. You know what? I'm going to get out of the house. I'm going to read a book. Or... I really want to call my ex and get closure and figure all this stuff, but knowing that that's not what they want, and then I just have to go, okay, you know what? No, I'm not going to do that. I want to do that, but you know what? It's probably not going to end well. Probably end in an argument and hurtful things being said. And you know what? By both of us, I'm just not going to do that. You know, grabbing these small lessons. So I can't be grateful enough for therapy, and for those people that I, some of that I mentioned, some who I haven't mentioned, who are there by me saying, you've got this, keep going forward. Just some of you who've just shown up every Sunday through this whole ordeal. Those of you who've listened online and kept listening and kept contacting us, kept supporting us through this whole thing. To me, I'm amazed and perplexed by it. I thought I was for sure going to run the thing into the ground through all this because I could barely get my clothes on in the morning or take a shower or do anything like that. But people stood with me. And that's how I've dealt with my mental issues and my mental health. Um, I think next week I won't be here. I'm going to be in Arkansas speaking. So Caleb's going to be preaching next week. 
But I think the following week I'll probably just get into some more uh, clear stories of everything that happened. But that's just a brief overview of what I've been dealing with with mental health issues, and it's my whole life. And don't be afraid. You know, yeah, this is a church that has a pastor who tried to unsuccessfully kill himself a year ago because he completely lost all hope in life and in people. Um, and had a few of those moments along the way in the past year. But I'm happy to say I'm at a place where I believe I want to drive this thing forward. And it's who I am. And uh, I've come out the other side, but you have to walk through it. Don't push it down. Don't run from it. Go through it. Do whatever it takes to go through it. Don't kill yourself because I'm telling you what, there is life after. There is a new life waiting for you if you can make it through. It is a different world and you will be a different person. And I am not the man I used to be. I am a completely different person than I was a year ago. And that sounds strange to say. And uh, yeah, those old demons come back and haunt me and say, no, do it the old way. And I go, no, I'm not going to have these thoughts. I'm going to let these thoughts pass by. I'm going to stick with what I know. Or, you know, I'm going to call Pete and be like, Pete, I'm going back into this idea. And Pete goes, no. Um, going to Wake, which is a festival that Pete puts on and a conference that Pete puts on in Belfast, Ireland, was about four or five months ago that I attended it. Um, and it was just different speakers and things like that and community of believers and non-believers and all these people together really helped me a lot. It was one of the best things I went to and did for myself. Just being around other people who are just living life, having questions, are afraid and scared and curious and hopeful and just being in the midst of all that tension was just freeing for me. And now I'm speaking for Pete next month at an event that he's doing in Belfast uh, called Spark and talking about some of this stuff. You know, so redemption is possible. And we can get through this. Um, and I've got through it. <clears throat> so I hope the people who, who need to hear this hear this. And for those of you who just don't understand it or don't get it, that's okay too. Um, what I hope you do get out of it is, is that when you see people suffering and crying and falling apart and going through things, don't belittle a person. Don't tell them just to get over it and move on. Go through it with them. Listen to their words. Find ways to encourage them. Try not to discourage them. Because I've had a couple friends where I don't ever probably want to see again, and I'm probably going to have to end up forgiving and going to them and talking with them. But because they told me I just needed to move on with my life and deal with it, and it just hurt bad. You know, so I hope that if you're listening out there and you're going like, well, what do I do with my friends with depression? Love them, be patient with them, listen to them, even if it's just gobbledygook because they're trying literally to stay alive. Help your friends stay alive because there is life, a life worth living on the other side of this hell. So with that, we're going to do um, Afterglow which is where we just have a conversation after the service and you guys kind of give feedback or talk and you, this is aired on, um, this will, this one will actually be connected to the sermon, I think, just because I think it's important. Um, but usually we do them separately so people can listen to Afterglow if they want to or skip it. But I think this might be a good Afterglow to share. I don't know. It might be short. It might be long. Who knows? I never know. But uh, was that good enough disclaimer? Oh, just for everyone here who hasn't been here before, if you're not comfortable being recorded, then we just won't put it up on. So, we're just going to talk. <clears throat> and then we'll do the, after that, we'll, we'll do the pass the hat and raise the money. So, any feedback? No, okay, great. <laughs>
or questions? Well, I'd like to say uh, I didn't think I'd ever come and actually say anything today. <laughs> uh, my brother just called me last night and said, hey, do you want to check out this Revolution Church tomorrow? And we heard of Jay Baker, and I said, no. What? And I haven't heard of the church. And then he explained a little bit more who you were. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. I had no idea, though. It's connection from the past, so it's really great seeing you here today and seeing what you're doing. Um, I timely service for me um, have had a long history of depression in my life. In my life, and I'm coming out of a pretty brutal, brutal episode. Um, not to get too just abbreviated uh, version of what's happening, but. Um, Today, I'm here, and what's gotten me here is um, I wake up every day and I say, I'm going to move my feet today. I'm not going to stay in bed today. Um, what I've learned is the voices that are very negative in my mind telling me how awful I am. Um, I call my Ted <laughs> after Ted Bundy, and what I've learned is that depression is a disease, and like every other disease, it wants you dead. Yeah. And I never really pieced that together. Um, I believe those voices, and now I now it's helpful for me to put a separate myself from that voice and actually look at this as a for me a psychopath man um, and say no. I'm not going to die today, Ted. You don't, you know, I don't believe what you're saying. Um, that's not my definition of myself. That's your definition of myself. And um, I go on with my day. And I look at the things that happen in my life, like being here with Kevin today. Um, and I am like, wow, if I had done what I wanted to do to myself, um, this never would have happened. And I get to be here with him. So that's my kind of feedback on what do I do when you give up hope? It's, you, it's hard. It's not as hard for me as it was a year ago, but you just keep your feet moving. And every day, what do I value? Even if you feel like you don't have anything to value, you have your children, you have something to value, so go get it. And that's just how I, my take on it. That's great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything yeah, that you said today. It takes a lot of, it takes a lot of guts. I was super nervous about today. Mm -hmm. The stigma is real. Yeah. Yeah. Very real. And I work in healthcare, and let me just say, you'd think if you worked in healthcare that that's, a stigma-free zone for mental health. You would not, the things that I hear my colleagues say about people that come to our hospital, you know, with mental, with, which happens every single week I'm there, there's a suicide attempt and, or somebody struggling, and they're not compassionate things. So it's hard, I'm starting to try to get up the nerve to come out in my profession and try to make it okay to come out in healthcare without maybe, I'm sure people will get me weird or think I won't be dependable, um, but I'm trying to build up the nerve, so thank you. Thank you. Well, as I've said many times before, it's your authenticity that helps me to continue living because I, I understand that I'm not the only one that struggles with these demons and I'm not the only one that has to wrestle with angels every day to get out of bed. Um, and today, I don't know if in the men's bathroom here, I've never been in there, hmm. but I don't know if you have chalkboards. Do you have a chalkboard? I don't think so. Okay, in the women's bathroom. Hmm. <laughs> Um, in the stalls, there's a chalkboard next to the toilet and chalk. 
and I've never ever written on the chalkboard until today. And I feel like this is for you and for all of us. Today I wrote, Always Hope. So thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jay. This is just wonderful. Very hard to do, and um, I uh, greatly appreciated sharing your story in this way today. Okay. Really, really meaningful and um, very powerful to hear you to, talking about this in a very um, articulate way, in a way that I I have a hard time sharing stories about my life, and it's very powerful to hear somebody that can do it and do it, does it very well. Okay. So thank you. And I feel like it is so good to hear you talking about um, this um, what, um, this new energy towards your towards um, what you do, and um, talking about wanting um, some books that you have ideas for writing. Yeah. Very exciting. Um, and um, using um, mental health um, uh, struggles with mental health in your work, I think is so powerful. I'm going to say that again because. Another person I just really, um, I really love her work is Maria Bamford, the comedian, yeah. and how much she uses her mental health struggles in her work. And it is so, I like love love it. I love how she uses it, yeah. and it's very powerful. And 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 you're a, 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 another prime example of that with with what you did today. So thank you for thank you for that. And um, I guess that's that's all I have. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. I would like to say something. I, uh, I've heard many sermons. I don't know if I'd call that a sermon, but really, maybe hundreds and hundreds of sermons, but that was a real sermon. And uh, really connected with me, I had a transplant, a heart transplant, down the road here in March. Mm -hmm. My sister took care of me. And... Uh, <clears throat> Usually the people after their transplant are all happy that I can start my life over. And, and with me, I was like, start my life over for what? My life's, uh, there's a lot of shit in my life. Yeah. And I'm still wrestling with it. It's like, I got somebody else's heart. That's great. Who would be unhappy about that? And I remember the uh, hospital uh, preacher coming in like the second day. And he was blown away, literally blown away by my my attitude. And my attitude, my attitude at that time said, so "In ICU, there's certainly a lot of drugs that are pumped into you. A lot at that time, I still haven't taken a lot. And uh, if you see me shaking, that's probably the steroids that I'm still on. But uh, but it really was kind of my Woody Allen moment. It was like, okay." Now I don't have a res I have more of a responsibility now, not just to my kids. Now I have a responsibility to this donor family, to the donor. I call it his spirit, but uh, and that's what I'm wrestling with still right now. Is uh, what, 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 why? I, I, uh, you know, Molly shared with me once. Uh, her therapist said, "Ask Molly, what would you want to be? Uh, what would you want on your tombstone?" And Molly said, "Just the word finally." <laughs> and so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, my kids keep me alive. And um, I, I think most of what I suffer with as far as depression is more situational. I don't think I have the, what I think is much more vicious is the genetic variant that I think Molly has struggled with. Um, you mentioned your poverty and things like that. And you can romanticize poverty especially when you're reading philosophy books and then yeah. reading about Spinoza and uh, those kind of guys. And uh, he voluntarily went through, well, I don't know about so much voluntarily, but part of what he went through was voluntarily, voluntary uh, poverty, uh, but also forced upon him. You know, I'm trying to find uh, answers with that, but um, that's what I'm struggling with right now. And, it's quite amazing that I, I haven't wanted to come to this for three years <laughs> after I watched your Sundance special and your just beautiful interactions with your mother. Thank you. And uh, it just happened to be this day where I, I asked Molly, hey, you want to go? It's something to do. And and, uh, and I could go on and on and on just to keep it simple. Um, 
that that was a, in so many respects that was I am an irascible Irishman like your friend. And you talked about contradictions and my love hate relationship with my brother in D.C. You know, with a fundamentalist Christian. Um, I went through my own horrible fundamentalist uh, experience, um, and that's a whole another conversation. But uh, so much I've been gone through. But it is there is positive after 40 years of struggling with the disease. I finally have a new start. But it's a new start to what? That's what I'm wrestling with right now. And, uh, and so I really thank you for that. That was, uh, uh, that was, that was, that was a service. Oh, thank you. I was worried about it. I thought it was going to be more emotional and I was a little bit more. <laughs> but um, it reminds me of this quote that Joe Strummer said, is the future is unwritten, you know, and you're going like, what's the new start, you know? And I, I, I said, the thing I wrote, I said, the future, you know, Joe Strummer said, the future is unwritten, and I look forward to it. I don't know what it is right now, but I have some hope for it. You know, and I don't think we always see what's going to happen next. But I think having kids, being true to ourselves, something could develop out of that. That's my two cents. But thank you. Brave Jay. Gets me all worked up just thinking back about that, man. That you were low, dude. Yeah. And Vicky and I were talking this morning about how different your your energy is and your attitude and your demeanor. Like that first month, man, like when you were doing the shock therapy and stuff, like I didn't see I saw Jay, but I didn't see Jay. Yeah. You were empty. But you're still coming here, you know, you were still hanging out whenever you could. And, uh, I don't know, man. I love you a lot, dude. I love you too, buddy. Thank you for saying that. It's yeah. nice to hear. It's nice when you notice other people notice your... Right. You know, the change. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it's not, like, you're not, like, honky-dory, like... I mean, that's the thing, too, about <laughs> mental health and... and Diseases like it, even you know, physical diseases like it, uh, like you were saying, Kevin. Like, it's it's never, it, at least with, with with certain things, it's never cured. You find new coping mechanisms, and and, and you, you, I don't know, you, I'm sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're comfortable with me saying this that that you're because uh, you kind of alluded to, to it yourself. You're not like. Oh, it's all over now. I'm all better. Like you feel like you're still, you, you are still bandaged and bleeding, like you said earlier. You know, and and at the same time, as as your friend, I want to say, like you, you're you've come a long way, man. That's such a corny thing to say, but like you, yeah, it's you are setting a very good example, Jay Baker. Um, in a lot of ways. Thanks, buddy. I mean, it's weird because it's I understand like you would I would hear stuff like that in the midst of my head, like people came through it or came yeah. through it and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, but then when you actually do, you know, so that's why I want to be like, no, 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 you actually can do this. You know, it's not just bullshit. It's not just a few people did it. You know, it's like, it really is something on the other side of it, but you have to work through it. You know, it's like certain theologies. You just can't grasp the death of God theology. You have to work through it. Yeah. You know, radical theology doesn't come from just being like, oh, I heard a Pete Rollins talk. You have to know. You have to read books and you have to go through it and you have to work on it and then come to the other side where you kind of understand it. Or otherwise you just flander. Mm -hmm. Flander is the right word. Just, what's the word I'm looking for? Flounder. Flounder. Yes, you just flounder. Flander is having an affair, I think. <laughs> Maybe you do that too. I don't know. <laughs> I don't recommend that. <laughs> Well, you know, there's no time limit to grief. <clears throat> no. There is not. And it shows up in some weird times. Sorry, I'm just letting my wife know I'm still in service. She took the kids today, thank goodness. Or this wouldn't have been the talk today. <laughs> I think the putting in work thing, it's, I'm not saying this like from experience necessarily because I've got a whole lot of work that I'm still doing and that I always will still be doing. Like I said earlier, but uh, it, it, I think it's kind of a good example with 
your mom when you brought up about like during the that communion that you all shared is, is being like you know where's God and I say this all the time it's like it's these people for, for me it's these people in this, in this room it's the, it's the body yeah. in Christian terms and it's like so where's 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 the intervention where's the divine and where's the deus ex machina sort of thing you know where's when's God going to sweep in and, and fix it all it's like well I've never seen that happen but maybe that is happening in us putting in work and in us uh, caring for each other and things like that and, and for ourselves you know because like it's like well mommy didn't do the chemo you know it's, it, it's like that that's that old joke like when the person's in the flood and they and they're like oh God's gonna save me from the flood and, and then uh, the cops send like helicopters and like a rescue squad and the person ends up dying in the flood and they're like God where were you and they're like well I sent a bunch of people to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bunch of helicopters yeah and helicopters and boats and stuff and it's yeah I don't want to sound like a broken record player but it, everything takes work and there's and maybe as far as the interventionist God thing goes too it's like there's not I at least I have never seen some some sweeping like hand from the sky or like or a lightning bolt from the you know on either side like a helping hand or a, a damning hand from the sky but but if that is what church is then I see that every day so yeah it's usually my friends who've intervened who don't believe in the interventionist gods so yeah that's what's interesting it's, you're the interventionist <laughs> You're the hand of the interventionist. See you, buddy. See you, Robert. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Caleb, do you mind passing your hat? Oh, sure. I'm just going to take a quick offering and just remind everybody online that we're a nonprofit and we can do this work um, because you make it possible. Um, through your donations, and you can go to revolutionchurch.com and make a donation uh, there. We have PayPal. It's pretty easy. And, uh, yeah, so check that out if you can. But we'd much rather have you than your money. So thanks. <laughs>